All right, let me get by you here. All right. Yeah, they're going to have to let you in. Okay, everyone. Um, like I said, I hope you had a good weekend. Y'all ready to get started? Yes. All right, so um, we're going to take a quiz, but I'm going to wait just a few minutes before we do it. Um, I just want to kind of get your brains going again. So, all right, so last time we were talking about the d this definition of the limit and some of the notation that we use. Uh, we finished up talking about this uh, left-hand limit, right? Remember the little plus and minus? Where is it? Uh, where is it? Okay, yeah, so if we have a little minus sign next to the number, that means we're approaching from the left. If there's a plus sign, we're approaching from the right. And that in order for the limit to exist, it has to be from both sides. And that's where we finished last time. And so now what we're going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a function. So I'm going to give you, uh, this is an example, okay? So I'm going to tell you, hey, look, there's this function out there that has these, oops, that I accidentally messed that up, that has these properties. And for what I'd like for us to do is try and draw this function, all right? So instead of me giving you a function and asking you what the limits are, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some of the limits and some other information about the function and ask you to draw it, all right? So let's, let's start out here with, the, with our x, y axes. So we're asked to sketch an example of a function with the following properties. So let's see, part one, we have the limit as x approaches negative 2 of the function f of x equals 3. So what does that mean? What does that mean? The limit as x approaches negative 2 of the function must be equal to 3. So when I, when I approach what number? When my x approaches what number? Negative. negative 2. So if I go to negative 2 on my graph, as I approach that, what ha as I approach that x value, my function should be doing what? Both sides, Both sides should be going three. towards 3, right? So let me go 1, 2, let's say this is 3. What I can tell you right now is that when I draw this function, from both sides, left and right, as I approach 2, my function should be approaching 3, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an open circle here, and I'm just going to make like a little tail coming off the sides like that. That's, that's how much I can tell you about my function right now. Does that make sense? Now why did I leave it as an open hole and not a solid dot? Because it, it's as it approaches negative 2. Yeah, because remember the limit talks about what's happening as we're approaching negative 2. It tells us nothing about what's happening at negative 2. So I still don't know whether or not at negative 2 I actually have function here or not. All right? So let's read the next thing. f of negative 2 is 0. Now this is, this is no longer a calculus thing. This is an algebra thing, right? This says if you go to negative 2, plug it in, you should get the function to spit out 0. So what should I put up here then? A dot at negative 2, zero. 0. So right here at negative 2, when we plug in negative 2, the function spits out 0. So I just I don't go up and down at all. So do you all see how that satisfies the first two properties? Let me see if I can fix this quickly. Oh. And all right, that way I can talk, talk about them. I can reference them by number now. So what about property three? Can you all see this OK? It's kind of small, but what is this saying? So when I go and take a look at my function and approach one from the left side, the function should be headed towards negative one. So let me go to one. Here's one. And when I approach from the left side, right, my function's value should be 
down one, negative one. So what should I put at one? Open circle again, and then from the left, I just need to be approaching in there, right? So I'm just draw like a little piece like that. Okay? That makes sense? Now, I didn't draw anything out to the right because part three only tells me what was happening as I come in from the left, right? Any questions on that? Okay, what about part four? I approach one, this time from the right, my function should be up at two, right? So if I go to one from the right, I should be approaching a value of two, so I'm gonna put an open circle here and a little tail coming out that way, all right? Okay, what about part five, property five here? F of one is two, is exactly two. So go out to one, go up two, draw a dot. And that just happens to fill in that, that hole, doesn't it? So I can put that as a solid dot now. All right. Property six, as I approach four, Right, as x approaches four, from the left, my function is headed towards infinity. So I'm gonna go out to the right, go four. See, two, three, here's four. As I approach from the left, my function needs to take off, right? So I'm gonna do like a vertical asymptote here, dotted line, and I'm just gonna make my function head up like that. Now notice, I mean, I think you've noticed this already, but I'm leaving a bunch of gaps in here in between these uh, pieces of my function. I'm gonna connect them together at the end, but right now I'm only allowed to draw what I know from these properties. All right, what about the seventh property? Approaching four from the right, my function is approaching zero, right? So this time, when I come in this way from the right, my function is gonna to wanna to go and approach zero, right? Now, it, is it actually zero at four? I don't know, right? So I'm gonna put an open hole here, and then from the right, like that. Now, could I, could, could I have done this instead? Yeah, sure. I mean, as long as it satisfies the property that you were approaching zero as we come in from the right. So everyone's picture is gonna maybe look a little different, all right? We just all have to have the same um, characteristics within our graph, all right? All right, last one. F of four is undefined, which means that when I go to plug four into the function, there's nothing here, right? I just leave it. This is a hole, right? There's nothing there. So I'm, I'm not gonna put anything there. And that's it, that's the last property, right? So now what I'm gonna do is just connect everything together. Yes? And then on, the, on, on number eight, would you draw the, would it be wise to draw an asymptote across the entire thing? You just say, hey, there's... You don't like, need to. You mean straight up and down? Right. Um, you don't need it, okay? okay? Um, this side is not acting like an asymptote, yeah. right? Only the left side's acting like the asymptote. Right? It's only the left. The right actually heads towards something. Never gets, you know, never actually gets to there, but it's headed towards it. All right, so I'm just gonna, I, I wanna finish this graph off. I want it to still look like a function. So over here, I'm just gonna make up my own stuff here. I'm just gonna draw something like a little arrow like that. And then here to here, I'm just connect these together like that. And then from here, I'm just gonna put those together and then over here, I think I'll just put a little arrow. So would everyone agree that that function that I drew satisfies all eight properties? And does everyone see how everyone in the class could have a slightly different picture, but that we're all, we should all have the same properties? Okay, so someone else could have drawn something like this, let's just say. Uh, they could have done that, that, that. So that purple one there would also satisfy every condition and would be correct. So in the homework for this section, there's a, a couple of problems where they give you some properties 
they ask you to draw a picture. I just didn't get a chance in class to go over one of those. All right, any questions? Yes? Okay, so this is just algebra. It's saying, look, when you plug one into the function, it needs to spit out two. So this is really saying that you have, you have the ordered pair one, two. That, that point is on your graph. So to the right one, up two, boom. Is that what you're referring to? Okay. So if you don't see the limit, then you're just doing ordered pairs. All right, so now if you could um, just take out a sheet of paper and just kind of put everything else away. And you're going to do your own work, which means to keep your eyes on your own paper, especially because we're sitting like this. During an exam, we will not sit like this, but it's too much work to rearrange the room, so I trust that you can keep your eyes on your own paper. Because I want to see how you do with this. It's one problem. It should just take you at the most four minutes at the most, I think. And I really am doing it just because I wanted to like give you a quiz, like just to get, get it out of the way. All right, so you ready? Put your name, make sure it's legible, and then put today's date, which is September 3rd, 2019. All right, you ready? All right, so all I want are for you to give me the answers to this. Um, it's one problem, parts A, B, C, D, and E. There's the graph. What's the limit, 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 that. Nah. Can everyone see it? Anyone have any issues seeing it? When you're done, raise your hand, I'll come pick it up from you. Yes. No, no, I, what is the limit as x approaches negative 3 of this function? What is the limit as x approaches negative 2 of that function? Yeah? What is the limit as x approaches 2 from which side? I'm not going to tell you, right? So you're looking at the graph and you're answering the question. Do we need to uh, draw the graph? You don't need to draw the graph. I just want answers. So your, your answer sheet should be just like part A, your answer. Part B, your answer. Part C, your answer. All right. Is that a question? Are oh, you done? Is that a question or are you turning in? Yes. I think so. What's up? How do I write multiple y values? Um, like, is it braces you, and comma? Your limit cannot be two different values. Let me say, you're on the right track, but I can't. 
I'll let you think about it. Yes. Yeah, just yeah, I'll go over it and then if you have questions, hopefully I'll answer that when I'm going through it. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. You got like one minute. I'll talk about that when, when I go through it. Yeah. Turning in? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Also, um, you all did not hand in that thing last time, right? No. Can you all get those out and I'll collect those also? Is that a question or are you turning? Okay. All right, you got about 20 seconds. We'll go over the quiz, okay? Thank you. Is there anybody else with the quiz? Yes. Uh, next time? Yeah, you have it though, right? Like you do. Everyone's turned in. What is that? No, no, this was the one. This was the one I want, yeah. That's, uh, that was an optional thing. Okay, so you, if you have the thing I, I asked you to fill out for me, if you could kind of group them together at your table, and then let's just kind of all try and pass them this way and get them to me, all right? Do I have all yours? Oh, it's typed up. I was like, okay, there we go. Okay, here, just put this. It's okay if it's not stable. It's all right. Yeah, don't worry about that. Nope, Jackson. Nope. I'll keep it together. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah. That here? All right, is that, did everyone get theirs passed forward? All right, what's the answer to uh, number one, part A? What is it? Two? No, that was, I was just, I gave that so you would see what I was going to ask you, yeah. Uh, the answer is two, that is correct. So let's try, make sure we all understand what's, what's being asked here. Saying, what's, what is the function doing as we approach negative three? From which side? Both sides. Right? If there's not a plus and minus, that means it has to be going to the same place from both sides. And that's okay because at negative three, if we approach from the left, we approach from the right, they're both appro approaching the same y value, which appears to be about two. All right, so that would be two. All right, now this one, we're approaching an x value of positive two, but we're approaching it from the left. So here's positive two. We're trying to um, imagine ourselves on the function approaching two from the left, and our y value is approaching what? about negative one. Here we're approaching positive two, this time from the right side, right? So positive two, we're coming in this way, so we're up here now, right? So we're up at three. And then what about the answer to part D? This, yeah, this is saying you have to be coming from both sides, right? And you need the same answer. But we already know that from the two different sides, we get two different answers. So the correct response to this is it does not exist. <laughs> All 
All right, you can also put D and E. You don't have to have these little dots. If you put undefined, I won't, I won't take off for this, for this quiz. But from here on out, we reserve undefined for places where we have holes in the graph, where the function is not defined. What we're saying here is that the limit doesn't exist. So two different things, all right? F of two. So this is just saying, what's the function's value of two? No limit here. So we just go to two, one, two, and we look for the dot, right? Anywhere where it's solid. So that's one. Okay. I think I did see someone here put um, this. Do you all know what that is? So this is actually the notation we use for something called the empty set. It's the set of nothing. And that is, so it's not the number zero, okay? Well, unless you're military, military sometimes they do that. Um, but in mathematics, this is the set of nothing. So imagine a basket that's empty, all right? If you were to throw some numbers into the basket, then it wouldn't be an empty set. So. This is a set that contains the numbers one, one, two, and three. A basket, number one, number two, and number three are in there, right? If I gave you a set that had nothing in it, that's this, all right? Now, is that the empty set? No, that's the set that has the number zero in it, okay? So two different things. But this is not an acceptable answer for this response, for, for a limit, okay? The empty set is not something we put. All right, are you all ready to, to do some algebra today? Good. It's the first quiz, okay? So don't get too depressed about it. All right, so look. Oh, and in terms of quizzes, I'm gonna hopefully have at least one quiz every week, all right? Um, I like to try and do them on Tuesdays because then you've had at least the weekend to go through your homework and things like that. But that's not to say you won't have one on Thursday. Um, and then at the end of the semester, if we do it that way, we should have at least 10, 11 quizzes in there. And I'll drop your lowest two. So long as we can get to like 10 or 11. If we only get to like nine quizzes, I'll drop one. All right. Okay, calculating limits. Moving into the next section. So, so far, everything we've done has been pretty much using a graph. I show you a picture, we talk about the limits. And that's what your quiz was over. I give you a graph, we talk about the limits. But what if you're just given the function and you're asked to find the limit without the graph? Well, this is going to require some work, all right? So to help us with this work, we have what are called our limit laws. These, these are the things that we are allowed to do. Okay, so uh, mathematicians, I told you last time we talked about this whole idea of like near, and we were gonna kinda say, eh, we're not gonna really go there, right? Well, mathematicians have carefully formulated these laws from the idea of the limit. And so throughout the rest of the class, we are allowed to use these. We're not here to prove them or anything else, we're just gonna use them. So the first law says this. If you're ever trying to take the limit of two functions that are added together, you do what you would hope you would need to do, and that is you could just break it up and look at them individually, all right? So this, this, allow, this limit law says that the limit of a sum, so the limit of a sum is equal to the sum of two limits. So you'll see me do that when I do a couple of examples. Just realize that the law tells us we can. And then number two, the only difference is that if there's subtraction, you're still allowed to do it. So if you have two functions being subtracted, you can do the limits of each one and get a final answer, all right? These are gonna look weird until we use them, all right? So just try and follow along for now. All right, this next one says that if you're trying to take the limit as x approaches some number a of c times a function, so this is multiplication. So c here is a constant. 
that what you can do is completely ignore the constant and take the limit of the function without the constant. And then at the end, multiply by the constant. So the constant kind of can just come out in front of the limit and you don't have to worry about it. Again, let me do some examples and you'll see what I'm talking about when we do this. I'll refer back to these when, when we do an example. All right, limit law number four. If you ever try and take the limit of a product of two functions, two, things, two functions being multiplied, then again, you can take the limits individually and then multiply those answers together. And trust me, this is a very nice thing that this happens because later on we we're gonna have a rule that doesn't behave like this and it's gonna be part of what makes calculus difficult, all right? But for now, this behaves just the way you'd want it to, right? And same goes for division. If you take a limit and you have a quotient, right? A function divided by a function, then just take the limit of the top one and the bottom separately, figure out what those answers are and then divide, just so long as the bottom one isn't zero. Because if the bottom one is zero, we already know you can't divide by zero, right? All right, this next one says that if you are trying to take the limit of a function that's being raised to a power, you can essentially push the limit inside the power, take the limit of the function, and then take that answer and raise it to the power. So it allows you to just kind of slide it inside there. You see that? All right, number seven. If you're ever trying to take the limit as x approaches a of a constant. So I'm going to actually, because this is a very specific example. What does limit law seven say this answer is? Five. Okay. It's saying, hey, look, let x approach four, right? Look at the function. It's five, right? There's no x in here. So whatever x is doing has no impact on that. So it's just going to stay five, right? That's what limit law seven says. The limit of a constant is just the constant. What about limit law eight? Limit as x approaches, let's say four, I'm just making this up, it says if you're trying to take the limit as x approaches a of the function x, what comes out? A. So what should, what should this be? Four, right? I mean, just think about it. We're saying, look, let x approach four, right? What's x approaching? Right? That's what this law is saying. It's obvious, but it's, it needs to be stated. All right? We can do that. All right, the next one, property 9, is another nice one. The limit as x approaches a of x to a power should be a to the power. I can do that over here. I can just modify this one. If I change this to x cubed, right, then this should become what? 4 cubed, right? Property 10, if you want to take the limit as x approaches a of the square root of x, it should just be the square root of a. So I could do that one over here again, so you can see that. What would this be? Square root of 4, which would just be 2, right? So would you agree that for properties 8, 9, and 10 so far, it appears that all we're doing is just like substituting in, like whatever the x is just gets replaced. So like, like over here, um, here's x, right? If I let x go to 4, I just replace that x with 4 and I'm done. It's almost like, like algebra where you just plug in a number, right? Just plug it in, it spits out an answer. There's nothing really calculus about this, but you'll see how this is going to be used. All right, property 11, last property here. If you have the limit of the nth root of any function, you're allowed to take the limit and do what with it? Put it inside the nth root, figure out what that answer is, and then take the nth root. So earlier we had this where we said we could slide the, the limit in. This is pretty much the same, same sort of thing. All right. We're, we're getting there. We're almost ready to start cranking a bunch of examples out here. So there, there, there are some nice properties that we have of the limit that can make our lives 
a lot easier. And this one right here is the, the most, I guess, useful one. It's called the direct substitution property. It says, before we begin, let us define a function's implied domain. So when somebody writes a function on the board right here, see this function? I'm not stating what the domain is, right? So imagine I didn't write this. I just gave you that function. It has what we would call an implied domain. It's understood that there are certain things you can and cannot plug in, right? So if we look at this, we did this last class, we know we can't plug four into this, right? Because we get division by zero. And we can't have a negative under the, under the root. So x has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? So those two things together tell us that the domain of this is all real numbers, every x in the real number system such that x is greater than or equal to zero so that the square root works. And then x can't be four and that'll take care of the denominator ever being zero. So this domain is understood when, we, when we're presented with this. That's called the implied domain, all right? So the direct substitution property says this. If f is a polynomial function, so what's a polynomial function? Study these in college algebra. Like x squared plus x minus four. Um, x to the fifth minus four x cubed plus 10. Right, all these like powers of x. That's a polynomial. If you're ever presented with a polynomial function, a rational function, which is a polynomial divided by a polynomial, you study those in college algebra. A trigonometric function, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, cosecant, secant, all those, right? An exponential function or a logarithmic function, any of those, which is almost everything you've ever studied, right? Then this says that as long as the number a that you are approaching in the limit, as long as that number is in the implied domain, then when you take the limit, all you do is directly substitute a into the function. So let me give you an example of this, all right? Let me just show you. What if we have this function f of x equals uh, sine x over x to the third plus 4x plus 1? All right, there's a function, right? Now, let me ask you, what is the limit as x approaches 0 of this function equal to? All right. So let's start putting things together, everything that we've just talked about. Is this a polynomial function, a rational function, an exponential function, logarithmic function, trig function? Is it any of those? So it has trig in it, right? It's also a ratio, right? But a, a rational function had to be a polynomial over a polynomial, right? So this by itself is not rational, right? It's not trig because it's got more than just trig. It's got this, right? So it's not a polynomial. It's not a rational function. It's not just a trig function. It's not an exponential function. It's not a log function, right? So if it's none of those, you can't use this property, right? However, didn't we just say a second ago in one of our uh, limit laws that if you have two functions, one on top of the other, that when you take the limit, you can do the limit on the top and bottom separately? Okay, so for this, what I can do using limit law, what limit law is that so I can refer to it? The one that has the quotient right there, limit law five. If you ever have the limit of a quotient of two things, you just do the limit on top and bottom. So I can come back here and I can say that this will be equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of the top one over the limit as x approaches 0 of the bottom one. And I'm using here um, limit law 5. I'm going to just circle 5 over this just so you understand I'm using the limit law 5 to do that. Does that make sense? Now, do these individually. Look at the top one. I'm now taking the limit of a trig function. Yes? Where did you get the x as x approaches 0? I just made it up. I could, have said, I, could have, I could have said x approaches 2. I just made this up. OK? So look at the top one, right? We have 
the limit of a trig function, just a trig function. So now we can use the direct substitution property, right? As long as what? What we're approaching is in the domain of that function. So what is the domain of the sine function? All real numbers, right? So zero is definitely in all real numbers. So all I have to do is just plug zero in and I'm done. Sine of zero is zero. So the top is zero. Do you all understand that? Now I need to do the bottom still. I'm not done. I'm taking the limit as x approaches zero of what type of function? Polynomial. So now I can use direct substitution property. Direct substitution property says so long as zero is in the domain, we're good to just replace it. And the domain of this is everything, right? This is a polynomial. So domain of, of polynomial functions is all real numbers. So just plug in zero for x. Zero here, zero here, and what would you get? One. And so zero divided by one is zero. So this limit is zero. Okay, so let me, let me go and try and illustrate graphically what we just did. I'm going to bring up my graphing utility here. And I'm going to type in that function. It was sine x over x. Hold on. I don't know where my raised is on this keyboard. Oh, there it is. Raised to the third plus... What was it, 4x plus 1? Okay, so there we go. Okay, so what I did just now is I had this graph, this function for us. There it is. And what we did is we tried to figure out what was happening, what's happening to this function as x approaches 0, right? And can you all see what's happening here? We said that, th that we should be approaching 0 from the left and the right. And is that what it's doing? At x is 0, as we approach from the left and the right, our function is headed towards 0. Okay? But we did it algebraically without any picture. Right? I'm only showing you the picture to verify the answer. Clear? So that example hopefully shows you how you can use the limit laws and how you can use the direct substitution property. All right. Now we're going to do all of these examples, all right? Because now we get to play with some algebra. And before we do it, I'm going to make it a little bigger so we can see it. Yeah, that's good. I have a handout for you. And it's free. It's a free handout. And I'm not real big on free handouts. So this one, you know, Today's your lucky day. Now, one of the first questions I'm going to have when I get hand this out is whether or not you can use this on a test. And the answer is going to be no. Because I need you to learn this. And the sooner you learn this, the better, more, uh, the better off you'll be. So. Go. Two, three. Here we go. All right. So this is what I call the limit summary. I, it's not, this doesn't have the title on it. If you want, you can write it at the top. This is what I'm going to refer to as the limit summary. So this pretty much is a little table that kind of helps you remember how to deal with limits whenever you see certain things happening, all right? So this is going to cover the whole semester. Everything we learn is in this little, not everything we learn, but when we talk about limits, it's all in, in, encompassed in this one little sheet. So we're not going to talk about, talk about everything that you see here right now. Just, we're only going to talk about one of the things. So you see in the, the top left, it has a box, and the first thing over there is this thing 0 over 0. You see that? And then next to it, it says infinity over infinity, and blah, 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 and it has all these other things. 
We are only going to talk today about this. All right. So what does it say within that box to do if you see 0 over 0? Use, use some sort of algebra or trick. OK? So now you have this. Let's do this example. All right? I'll, that table will make more sense as we, as we move through it. OK, take a look at this limit. What is x approaching? 1. OK? All right, so is that a polynomial, rational, exponential, log, trig, function? What is that? It's a poly over a poly, right? which means it's a rational function. So can you use the direct substitution property? Yes. yes. So try and just plug 1 in for x and see what you get. All right? Just replace all your x's with 1's. I'll move this down so I can reach it. OK. So I can use direct substitution. So this should be equal to 1 squared plus 1 plus 2 over 1 plus 1. And what am I getting here? 4 over 2, which is 2, right? That's it. Did we have any problems there? No. That was almost like an algebra question, wasn't it? Just like plug one in, that's all we did? Okay, so there's nothing interesting happening to this function as we approach one. As we come in from both sides, if we were to graph this, we should be approaching two. Do we need to see the picture or you believe it? You believe it? Okay. So whenever you're doing limits, the first thing you ever want to do is see what happens if you do direct substitution. If you do direct substitution and you get an answer that, that makes sense, like 2 is a number, it makes sense, then you're done. Box it and move on, OK? But don't forget that. That's always your first step. So let's move to the next example. All right, so what type of function are we trying to find the limit of here? Is that a polynomial, rational, exponential, log, blah, blah, blah? What do we got here? Another rational function, right? Can we use the direct substitution property here? This time we can't. And the reason we can't is because 1 is not in the domain of this function, right? It's not in the domain. Now, let's just see what would happen if we tried direct substitution right now, what, what would we get? Let's see. So if we tried it, I'm going to put an arrow here because I don't want to put equals. If we tried direct substitution, up top we would get 1 cubed minus 1 over 1 minus 1. And that would give us 0 on top and 0 on the bottom, right? And this is what I told you last week was at the heart of calculus. Is there a way that we can still come up with an answer to this, right? Make, make somehow make that make sense, right? Now, I'm going to graph it first before we do it. I want you to see we are going to get an answer. So I'm going to do x cubed minus 1. Is it messed? Oh, that's all right. I'll fix it. <sighs> Delete. OK, here we go. x cubed minus 1 over 1 minus x, right? Yes. There's the graph. And what were we approaching? On the thing, what was it? We were approaching 1, right? One. Yeah. So what is the limit of this function as x approaches 1? Take a look. Negative 3. Negative 3. So I'll move up so you can see this, OK? So as we approach 1, right, from both sides, right, our function is approaching negative 3, isn't it? Now, what this graph is not showing you is the fact that there's actually a hole here. There is a hole, right? Because at 1, you can't plug 1 into that function, can you? You can't. So the computer isn't really showing us that there's a hole there, but there is a hole there. But it, we still have a limit, right? The limit exists. It should be negative 3. So let's see. How are we going to get to that answer? We should be able to get to negative 3, right, as an answer? So when we try direct substitution, we get 0 over 0. And according to the table, when you see 0 over 0, when you're taking a limit, you should do some sort of algebra or some sort of trick, all right? 
So what algebra is kind of like popping out at you there that you could do for this function? Factor, okay, factor what? The numerator, right? The numerator, x cubed minus one, is a difference of cubes. And there's a formula for the difference of cubes, right? Okay, so this becomes, now watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna rewrite limit, lim, x approaches one. Notice I'm putting the x approaches one underneath the lim, right? For some reason, my computer just always wants to force this out front. It's just a problem I'm having with the computer. So when you write it, you should put it underneath. It's just, that's the notation most people use. And now what I'm gonna do is just factor. So the top, what is x cubed minus one factor to be? No? So I got that. I got that formula from my head, but it's actually somewhere in your algebra class. Uh, if you've forgotten it, it should be on your cheat sheets, your little formula sheets. Should be there. Yeah, let, let's just write it down. If you have a cubed minus b cubed, it's a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared. That's the formula for difference of cubes. There's another formula for the sum of cubes. So that's the one I'm using right here. A for us is x and b is one. So just plugging those in, you get that. All right, so I, I've done some algebra, right? Does that help though? I mean, are we, are we, have we gotten anywhere here? Somehow we need to get to three from this. Or sorry, negative three, wasn't it negative three? Does anyone see what we can do? Yeah, there's something about this that we should recognize. Is that what you're going to mention? Yeah, you can pull the negative out. Okay, good. So we notice that these two factors are off by a sign, right? This is positive x, negative 1, or positive x minus 1, and this one is 1 minus x. So they're off by a sign. So what we can do is we can, again, Write equals, write the limit again, write x goes to one. Do not get rid of that limit, okay? When you're taking a quiz, taking a test, if you're doing this, you must write limit each time, each time, until the very end when we actually let x go to one. That's when you can stop writing it, all right? So if you're missing that, I'm taking off points because it's just, it's like missing commas and periods in a sentence. It has to be there. Uh, all right, so I'm going to factor negative one out. So I'm hoping everyone here is comfortable with this. I'm going to factor negative one out of the bottom. So do we agree that if I pull a negative one out of each of these, then this is what I'd be left with? So if I distribute that back through, I'd get back this. So why is it, why is it that I did that? Because now they cancel, right? Because this is actually, if I flip the order, is x minus one. And now that factor and that fa factor will, will cancel, right? Cancel is the word we use. Technically, it should be reduce, okay? That's, it reduces, it becomes a one, all right? But students like to use cancel, so we'll just say cancel. Cancel, cancel. And now, let's see what we're left with. Limit, x approaches one. What's still left? I have the x squared plus x plus one on top. What do I have on the bottom? Negative, Negative one. Okay, so now I have kind of like a rational function again. And if I let x approach one, I don't have any issues anymore, right? I don't have that domain problem anymore. And so I can just plug in one. So no more, no more limit. I'm doing a direct substitution into this. I get one squared plus one plus one over negative one, which is negative three, which is what the picture said we should get, right? Y'all see that? So we are able to take a function, look at it, take a limit to a value that we know the function is undefined at, and we are able to get some meaningful answer out of it, yes? Right here? Could I not write limit here? Is that what you're asking? I'm asking like where do you stop in this, in this 
years. When did you replace X with one? At what step? This step, right? That's when I stopped writing it, okay? So you have to wait until to the line that you let X become the one. That's when you can get rid of the limit, okay? All right, so a little bit of factoring here, some stuff with the negative one. This is all within, it's all fair game, right? Okay. Uh, what else do I want to say about this? Or something else I want to say. Um, could you have factored the negative one out of the top one instead, like out of here? Yes. Yeah, you could have done that. Pulled the negative one out of here, made that negative x plus one, they still would have canceled or reduced. Oh, I remember what I was going to ask you. This is important. Very important, actually. I want you to consider these two functions. Okay, so just we're going to back burner everything for a second. I'm going to put two functions on the board here. We're going to have a competition. The f function versus the g function. Are these functions the same functions? So they look like they would give you the same thing no matter what, right? Except if x is 0. So if I go to my, my computer, right, and I say, hey, graph x over x. It's that red line. Y'all see that up there? And if I ask it to graph the function 1, Well, it's there, but you can't see it because it just drew right on top of it. They look identical, don't they? What the computer is leaving out is the fact that the x over x function has a hole, right? This one, when I graph it, looks like this. Here's one, right? It's like that, it's like that, but it has a hole here, right? This one is solid, right? So then someone would, would say, hey, well, wait a minute. No, that doesn't make sense because I was taught just cancel these x's and that's one. And then they're, then they're the same, right? Well, here's, here's what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make. When you do this step from here to here and you reduce, you cancel like that, there's like an asterisk. If you've ever like had to sign something important, like anyone ever get a credit card or something like that, and there's always that little small print at the bottom that you never read, okay, that's, that, that, there's, there's small print right here. When you do this, you are saying, so long as x is not 0, OK? So you're only allowed to cancel that if you're promising me that x can't be 0. If x isn't 0, then this is totally allowed. So over here, do you see where we reduce this, right? Where we cancel these? We have an asterisk here. And we're saying, so long as what? That factor is not 0. As long as x minus 1 is not 0, right? So long as x minus 1, the factor we're canceling, is not 0, then I'm allowed to cancel. But what is this really saying? So long as x is, just add 1 to both sides, not 1, right? So then you're going to get mad at me, because didn't we let x become 1 later? Okay, but we actually didn't let x become 1, we let x approach 1, okay? This limit means that we can still do this canceling because we are still promising this is not going to happen because we are doing a limit. We're not plugging 1 in, we're letting x get closer to 1, all right? I hope that kind of makes sense. All right, let's do the next example, example C. All right, so for this one, is that a rational function? Is it a polynomial divided by a polynomial? No, it's not, because the top function is a root function, isn't it? OK, so let's, let's try and do this one by, doing, by breaking it up into two limits and doing each one of them. If I do the limit of the top, what would happen if I, just, if I tried just replacing x with 0? So I'm just going to see what this looks like if I try direct substitution. Yeah, you're going to get that. And then on the bottom, if we directly substitute, we get 0. 
And then what is that going to be? Zero over zero. And this is not good, right? This is why we're here. We're here because we want to be able to do that. All right? So we go to this. We say zero over zero. We need some algebra. We need some trick, right? So hopefully we can get to it. This one, I'm not going to show you the graph first. I'm actually going to see if we can't come up with the answer, and then we'll check it with the graph. So the question becomes, what algebra are we going to use here? The last problem we used factoring, right? And it worked out. Here, we don't have anything to factor, do we? So as a Calculus 1 student, what you're going to see is that there's a lot of like tricks and, and ways to attack things that you just need to see someone do it like the first time and then you know, okay, hey, look, that's something I can try, all right? So for this, does anyone know how to attack it? Maybe someone's seen something like this before or has some sort of intuition as to how to go about it? Did you try rationalizing it? Okay, rationalizing. What do you mean by rationalizing? Okay, so you're, you are on the right track. We are going to introduce, it's called rationalizing, um, but the way I want you to think about this is we're going to, whenever you see roots, okay, one of the things that you can try is multiplying by the conjugate of, of the root expression you see here, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce a one to this. I'm going to multiply this fraction by one. But the one that I'm going to choose is going to be very careful. It's going to be square root of x plus one plus one over square root of x plus one plus one. What makes this thing right here the conjugate of that? What, what is it that makes the conjugate? Plus. It's the opposite of this sign. So if this is minus, this is plus, those two are called conjugates. If this was a plus, then we would do a minus here, right? Okay, so somehow this is just like, let's go for it, right? Like, let's see what happens. So when we multiply fractions, we got to go straight across the top. So I put this in parentheses. And now we're going to play our little game, right? We're going to foil this out, if, if you like that, right? Let's foil it out. So we get limit, x approaches 0. Uh, let's see. What's this times this? What's root x plus 1 times root x plus 1? Just x plus 1. All right, what about the middle pieces? Do I even care about them? Yeah. No, because they're going to cancel. That's the whole great thing about the conjugate, is that the two middle terms will cancel every time. Now, we can just see it. Like, if I do this times this, I'm going to get that root times positive 1. And if I do the middle one, I'm going to get that root times negative 1. And so they're completely opposites, and they'll cancel each other out. Now, we still have the last term, right? To multiply, what's the last terms here to here? What do we get? Minus 1. So all we get up top is minus 1. Agreed? Now, on the bottom, any questions? On the bottom, do not multiply this through, OK? Just leave it written the way it's written. x, and then in parentheses, square root of x plus 1 plus 1. And I think you're about to see why it is you don't want to multiply that x through the bottom. What's going to happen up in the numerator on the next line? The ones are going to cancel. See, I'm still writing the limit, right? x is on top, x over square root x plus 1 plus 1 in parentheses. Now I can reduce the x out, right? So long as little asterisk small print. So long as what? That x is never 0, zero which it's not going to be because I'm taking the limit as x approaches 0, right? So that reduction or cancellation is allowed. I'm going to write one more line with the limit. What do I have up top? 1. one. So don't forget, this is still a fraction. And on the bottom, we don't need the big parentheses anymore. There we go. Now you can let x go to 0. 